Welcome back, everybody. I hope you uh, have enjoyed and are enjoying your lunch. Um, I'm honored and delighted to have our to introduce our lunchtime keynote, Dr. Eleanor McCann's Katz. As Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, Dr. McCann's Katz advises the HHS Secretary on improving behavioral health care in America and leads the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Admi Administration, um, SAMHSA. Uh, Dr. McCann's Katz is the first such Assistant Secretary. She attained her PhD from Yale University where she studied epidemiology and, and uh, isol infectious disease and is a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. She's board certified in general psychiatry and in addiction psychiatry. Indeed, she's a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry with more than 25 years as a clinician, teacher, and clinical researcher. Dr. McCann's Katz has served in high roles in the university, in the Rhode Island mental health and addiction system, including overseeing services uh, for uh, those with the most serious mental illnesses requiring long-term uh, inpatient treatment. Dr. McCann's Katz was also a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. Previously, she served as the chief medical officer for SAMHSA and served at the University of California, San Francisco as a professor of psychiatry, as medical director for the California Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, and as a medical director of SAMHSA's clinical support systems for buprenorphine and opioids. She's quite an amazing person. We are honored and delighted to have Dr. McCann's Katz give the plenary address at today's SAC Symposium. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and um, I'm really so pleased to have the opportunity to, to speak at this conference. I was, I was very honored that Ellen would ask me to come and do this. Um, I'm going to talk today about, about what, what, um, what I want to do in our federal government to try to move things forward for people living with serious mental illnesses. Uh, and uh, I'm going to um, talk first about serious mental illness and how disabling that can be. I am a psychiatrist. I have spent um, my career um, working um, for the most part, I will say, in addictions, and um, specifically opioid addictions, so I do spend a lot of time on that, but also at that interface of people who have um, serious mental illness plus addictions, and often in the context of infectious diseases like HIV. So, so I've spent my career working in the public sector, and working with people who have uh, complex illnesses. And so I have been able to see how disabling these conditions can be. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the history of involuntary treatment in the United States, standards and unintended consequences of some of that history, including justice involvement. Uh, I'm going to mention assisted outpatient treatment, which I see as a potential resource if done right, uh, and what uh, resources we have that we should continue to expand. So I'll talk to you about some of what we're doing at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, what we're doing within the Department of Health and Human Services, and then I hope we'll have a little bit of time to talk as a, as a discussion. So serious mental illnesses, and I'll talk mainly about psychotic disorders, although I don't want anyone to think that I only think that psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, are serious mental illnesses. Mental illnesses can be quite serious for the individual depending on how that illness affects them. So there are many mental disorders that can be life-threatening, quite serious, but for the purposes of today, I'll talk mainly about those illnesses that, um, that are associated with psychosis, including hallucinations, delusions, paranoid thinking that can be incapacitating for people. Um, and also, um, these illnesses can uh, produce a, a situation where the person has difficulty with what we call reality testing, interpreting what's going on in their environment, which can be very frightening for somebody. Um, in addition, 
uh, and I think what's not talked about enough, is that illnesses like schizophrenia have a very significant cognitive impairment associated with them. People that have schizophrenia untreated often have difficulty making decisions and understanding information so that they can make good decisions. Um, they have difficulty focusing. They can have difficulty with paying attention. Uh, many have a symptom called anisonosia, which has been alluded to a couple of times today, but that is the condition in which a person uh, with this major uh, serious illness does not understand or realize that they are affected by that illness. And so these symptoms or combinations of symptoms can be disabling for people, uh, resulting in an inability for them to care for themselves. Uh, sometimes rejection of the, the diagnosis uh, itself, um, refusal of care, and in some cases, and these are uh, not not the usual, but there can be times when a person can become dangerous. And that's really what we've been addressing here today. So there are lots of consequences to untreated serious mental illness. Um, we know from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a survey that, that the agency that, that uh, I'm responsible for, SAMHSA, uh, does every year. It does uh, an anonymous survey of about 63,000 Americans, and from that extrapolates to the population at large in the United States. What that survey tells us from the most recent year that we have data, which is, is 2016, is that we have over 11 million people in this country with serious mental illness. However, it's really important to note that the vast majority of them um, are, do not represent dangerous people, uh, but there is a small but important number that do. We have uh, 140,000, is, these are estimates from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, 140,000 people with serious mental illness who are homeless in the United States, uh, about 250,000 with any mental illness homeless. Um, People with serious mental illness, unfortunately, are incarcerated, uh, and this has, in this country, become the de facto mental illness treatment facilities in this country. Uh, but the reality is that most people with serious mental illness or substance use disorders will not get the care and treatment they need in the correctional system. 392,000 with serious mental illness are estimated to be incarcerated. About two-thirds of them are in prisons, and about a third of them are in jails, prisons being longer-term sentences than jails. Um, 26,000, unfortunately, for a conviction of murder. 755,000 plus people with serious mental illness are on probation or parole, um, and over two million people uh, on probation or parole have a mental illness of some kind. And we also know, and this is much more likely than a person with serious mental illness being a perpetrator of violence, they're much more likely to be victimized. We know that about 25% of people with serious mental illness, three million people, uh, were victims of a violent crime in the past year. That's 11 times higher than for those of us who are not affected by mental illness, by, by, by those kinds of serious conditions. And we also know that people who have schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, they are at much higher risk to attempt and complete suicide. It's estimated that the lifetime risk of suicide for schizophrenia is 5%, and for people living with bipolar disorder, it is up to 15%. And then the other, the other issue that is really hugely important is that people with serious mental illnesses don't get the physical health care that they need. And so what happens is there is a lack of attention to physical illnesses that occur in people that have these serious mental illnesses. And you can read any number of different kinds of papers about this, and there are estimates of the reduced life expectancy. A conservative estimate is that people with serious mental illness will die 10 years sooner than those of us who do not have these disorders. So these are hugely important issues, and they are hugely important consequences of untreated mental illness.
Now, in the United States, uh, we have a history of commitment, compulsory treatment for those with mental disorders. Um, the state has an interest in protecting the vulnerable. Parents patriae, the responsibility of government to intervene on behalf of citizens who cannot act in their own best interest. The state has police powers, and some of those police powers include the right to act on behalf of the safety of all citizens and doing that in a statutory way. So there are pieces of legislation that dictate uh, what happens with folks that have mental disorders and, uh, and are thought to be unable to care for themselves or represent a threat to themselves or others. Uh, and this, of course, infringes on the liberties of individuals. Physicians and other healthcare professionals, depending on what state you live in, often make the assessment in the case of mental illness as to whether somebody is going to um, be committed or not. If we look a little bit at the history of commitment in the United States, um, what we would see is that um, the first asylums uh, were built in the Northeast between the years of 1817 to 1824. And at that time in our country, back when our country was very young, institutionalization of a person with a, with a, uh, a mental illness um, required only a recommendation for treatment. And that recommendation would take away one's liberty, would cause them to lose their civil rights and their property. Um, this was abused quite a bit in the United States, and because of those abuses, the standards changed to provide a right to legal representation uh, and to a trial prior to coerced treatment. And those decisions at that time were with judges and magistrates, um, but due to long delays, and during the time of those delays, and this is back in you know 100 years and more ago, long delays in getting people the legal, um, the legal um, rights that they were entitled to, they were uh, institutionalized. And because of those long delays and loss of freedom that people experienced while they were waiting for their rights, um, psychiatrists increasingly became involved with the uh, assessment around whether a person needed compulsory treatment. And that was codified actually in 1951 in something called the Draft Act Governing the Hospitalization of the Mentally Ill out of the National Institutes for Mental Health. And in the 1950s, we saw the absolute peak of inpatient, long-term, psychiatric hospitalization. Over 550,000 Americans in the 1950s were institutionalized in long-term psychiatric facilities. But we also saw some very important changes occur in the 1950s. One of them was the discovery of antipsychotic medications. And those medications allowed people to regain the ability to care for themselves and to leave institutions. Um, it led to an overall rejection by the American public for, of the need for massive involuntary hospitalizations. And a civil rights movement really evolved during this time and, and continues to the present uh, that that led to a push away from state mental hospitals to more humane treatment, you know, treatment in communities. In 1963, President Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act, which was meant to pave the way from state hospitalization to outpatient care and community living for people with serious mental illnesses. So over that time, from the mid-1950s, until the 1990s, we saw massive closures of state hospitals. We saw people released from those state hospitals. We went from 550,000 being hospitalized in the, in the 50s to about 30,000 beds in the 1990s. And we also saw commitment standards change. So as people left the state hospital system, the standard for commitment changed 
from need for treatment to dangerousness, suicidality, homicidality that's imminent, uh, which I'm no lawyer, but I think that from my reading it looks like legally that's called a close future event, and grave disability or the inability to provide for necessities for basic survival. Those legal rights continued to be defined through the 1970s into the 1980s. They included rights to representation, rights to hearing for hospitalizations longer than what states had put in place. And if you go to any particular state, you may find different standards for how long you can emergently involuntarily treat a person on an inpatient basis. It can be anywhere from up to a couple of days to two weeks. But what was made very, um, uh, what was put in place was the right of that person to have a hearing with a magistrate, with a judge, to assure their rights. And there was also a requirement put in place for the least restrictive level of care to meet the needs of non-dangerous patients. Very important, um, there was a decision called the Olmstead decision that said that people have a right to the least restrictive um, level of care and to live in communities. I personally think that that is one of the more important decisions we've had. Uh, I don't think that we always live up to it and we need to do a better job. So I want to say a little bit about where we are today um, because uh, I wish that, um, that things were, um, were at a point where we could have, uh, have a system that's very much uh, uh, universal in this country as, as Dr. Zeller talked about, but I can tell you because I'm a psychiatrist too that it's not, that's not the way it is in most places still. So we have a lot of work to do. But one of the things that has happened with the changes, with the deinstitutionalization and the change in commitment criteria is that it now has become nearly impossible for somebody to be admitted involuntarily to a hospital for inpatient care. And if they are, it's likely to be very, very short. So families so often have to stand by and watch their loved ones who are nonviolent, as most seriously mentally ill are nonviolent, decompensate to the point of being unable to care for themselves. There's been a marginalization of the seriously mentally ill in the United States. We've seen increases in homelessness, incarceration, which I have personally witnessed having been the medical director of the state hospital in Rhode Island is often used as a means of obtaining treatment for somebody. Uh, if they have a legal charge and they're thought to have serious mental health issues, it's a quick way to get them into the state hospital, into the forensic unit. That's not right. It shouldn't be that way in this country. And it's important that we really work on this because this again is data from the 2016 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Mental and substance use disorders are very prevalent very prevalent in the United States. We know that about 18% of our population, our adult population, over 44 million Americans have a mental illness and 25% of them have serious mental illness. We know that over 20 million Americans have a substance use disorder. Most of them have an alcohol use disorder. 75% of people in this country that meet criteria for a substance use disorder will have an alcohol use disorder. But a third of them, 33%, have an illicit drug use disorder. And 11% have both alcohol and drug use disorders. It's also true that a substantial number of Americans, over 8 million Americans, have what we call co-occurring dis um, disorders, both a substance use and a mental disorder. These are complex conditions. I will tell you that treating one does not treat the other. If a person has both types of conditions, they need care and treatment and recovery services for both in order for them to be able to recover and live the fullest lives possible. We also know Unfortunately, there are over 2 million Americans in jails and prisons. It's estimated that 50% of them have a substance use disorder, and up to 20% of them have a serious mental illness. 
most of them will not get the care and treatment that they need while incarcerated. That is not the place for people living with these conditions. So we have issues in justice populations. The reality is in the United States that we have large numbers of people with mental and substance use disorders who are incarcerated. As I just said, few of them get treatment. This is a failure on the part of our states to provide adequate mental health care and treatment for substance use disorders in community settings. This is something that needs to change. We try to work on this at the federal level, but those of you in states, you need to understand that states must act on this. They must take care of their citizens. We have state civil commitment laws that are inadequate to provide necessary treatment and necessary duration of treatment. And there is a failure to use those laws to compel treatment for individuals at risk of harm to self or others. Too often that occurs and the results can be very, very harmful to the individual and sometimes to others. This, this situation, the way it is in the United States, contributes to people with serious mental illness having infractions. Um, generally, at least in my experience, it's usually um, what I used to I don't know if, it's, if I should say this or not, but I used to call them nuisance crimes because, because they're kind of nothing. It's um, trespassing or it's um, disturbing the peace or something that, why in the world should somebody be incarcerated for that? Um, but that's what happens so often. And again, um, I've had the experience of seeing people use it, those charges are used to get them into a state hospital system. That shouldn't have to happen. People should be able to go to community services and get their needs met. So these infractions that are committed while somebody is impaired by untreated mental illness um, and legal charges that result from drug use have lots of consequences for the individual. Once you get these convictions, it's much more difficult to get housing it's much more difficult to be employed. It, if you can't get housing and you can't get a job and you don't have income, you're at very high risk for recidivism. How is anybody, I mean any of us in this room, how would we manage? How would we manage if we don't have a place to live and we don't have any source of means to get the things we need in life? So the transition from incarceration to release can be very challenging. Um, because people with mental health needs are frequently lost to follow up when they're released from incarceration. Uh, and often, anastenosia can make it difficult for that person to recognize that, that they should. They should go to a community mental health center. And that can lead to non-adherence and this cycling of these adverse outcomes so that people are in and out, in and out of jails and sometimes prison. We, we can do better than this. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And we, I think it's also important to, to say something about advances in our understanding of serious mental illness. Because uh, too often, too often this is talked about as just some sort of behavioral issue as though, as, as though if somebody wanted to, they could behave uh, in a different way. When in fact, these are brain disorders. And we know that. We know that schizophrenia has multiple etiologies, abnormal brain development, evidence for neurodegenerative processes, including the atrophy of neurons, brain cells, progressive structural brain changes over the lifespan, genetic vulnerability to serious mental illness, abnormalities of neurotransmitters, those chemicals in your brain that make it possible for you to think, for you to function. We have, a, we have various types of brain neurotransmitters. Um, we're learning the role of glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid neurotransmitter, and its effect on the dopamine system. For many years, we've heard about the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. Well, it's much more complicated than that. It's much more complicated. But the, but the bottom line is, these are these are medical illnesses. We have, we have 
We have evidence that there is, there is a, an issue with more refractory symptoms and a more severe course of illness with increased duration of untreated psychosis. So it's very important that we, that we intervene early, that we get people care and services that they need to try to diminish, diminish the severity of that illness. We also know that medications that address psychosis can also help with some of the cognitive aspects of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, such as attention, memory, learning over time. I mean, if you think about it, if you have an illness that makes it difficult for you to pay attention, makes it difficult for you to remember things, and if you can't remember things, how do you learn things? How do you move forward in your life? We need to be able to recognize these problems as they occur in young people growing up and, and the onset of these kinds of illnesses are in adolescence and early adulthood for the most part. We also have developed cognitive therapies, non-medication types of treatments that can assist a person in managing their own illness. We know that peer supports can help people living with serious mental illness to be successful in their communities. And we know that early intervention improves function and diminishes impact of illness. And so my question is, why aren't we demanding that people with psychotic disorders have access to treatment? This does not happen in the United States in a way that gets the attention of decision makers so that we can put these services in place. I'm happy that we've had some advances in legislation, but we need a whole lot more. And people sitting in this room, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Let me talk a little bit about potential solutions. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about assisted outpatient treatment. Um, New York has, a, um, has something called Kendra's Law that requires wraparound services for people who have um, had a serious mental illness um, with dangerousness and a court-ordered treatment plan. And they have found very positive outcomes. Um, decreased homelessness, decreased hospitalizations, decreased length of hospitalization, fewer arrests, um, less substance problems. And in one study, 81% of people said that assisted outpatient treatment helped them to get and stay well. It's important that if we provide something like assisted outpatient treatment, it can't be just medication. It has to be paired with community recovery supports so that a person can move forward in their life. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at the federal level to address serious mental illness. Um, I'm very grateful for people who serve on what is called the Interdepartmental Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee. That's where I had the honor to meet Alan Sachs, and I think that's why you asked me to speak today. <laughs> I think. Um, but the, the Interdepartmental Serious Mental Illness Committee, this, this is a federal and public partnership that was put together in the 21st Century Cures Act, um, which as you know was passed in uh, December of 2016, signed by President Obama, and continues under the Trump administration. Um, it requires a review of the current state of treatment and recovery services in the United States for serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbances in our youth. Um, a report has been generated by our public members who did an amazing amount of work to really inform the federal government about the state of what's happening with people living with serious mental illness in this country and where we need to focus our attention. The report that our public members, really with, with help from those of us in federal government, but really that the heavy lift, the work was done by our public members. And I should tell you that our public members are very diverse. Um, our public members include people uh, with lived experience. They include family members, um, clinicians, researchers, law enforcement. We have a, a, a judge on this, the ISMIC. And um, all of these people have come together to bring their knowledge and their experience to put, put some pressure on us in the federal government to do better, to do more. 
um, I personally thought that this was so important that I, I put a full-time person at SAMHSA on this. We have a full-time person whose job it is to push this forward. So we at SAMHSA are the ones that are responsible for coordinating what goes on in the federal government as it relates to serious mental illness. And we have a person who interacts with federal agencies that have funding from Congress to take on issues and serious mental illness to make sure they're doing what, um, what they are um, assigned to do through a statute, and also to work collaboratively with them because um, it's interesting to me just how much good work is going on in the federal government that I think most people don't know about. So there was a report that was due to Congress in December of 2017, and we did, um, we did get that report to Congress, that summarized advances in serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbances in our youth, um, evaluated the effect of federal programs uh, that uh, uh, related to serious mental illness, and the, and the public members made 45 specific recommendations for actions that federal agencies can take to better coordinate administration of mental health services, um, and they organized into five focus areas. So I want to mention those to you because I think you'll see that there's a very great breadth and depth to what our public members are telling us and, uh, and what we will continue to seek advice about. So they thought that we needed to strengthen federal coordination to improve care, that our agencies need to drop the silos and start working more collaboratively. They also uh, gave us uh, um, areas in uh, access and treatment engagement, um, ideas on how we can make it easier uh, for people living with these illnesses to get good care through early identification and intervention for youth, crisis intervention services, continuum of care types of services, outpatient services as alternatives to hospitalization, and looking at psychiatric bed capacity. I will tell you, there's not enough beds right now for the people that need them. The waits are too long. But if we had a full continuum of effective outpatient services, I don't know how many psychiatric beds we would need. I'd like to get to that point where we have that outpatient continuum. Uh, and so would our public members. Uh, they advise that we reassess civil commitment standards and processes, although I will tell you these are in the purview of the states. I believe that's in the Constitution. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I believe the Constitution says that if power is not given to the federal government, it um, reverts to the states, and so this is something that you all need to work with your states on. Uh, but we will we at the federal level often provide guidance to states and we will look at this, uh, we will look at these issues. And uh, they also advised us to increase um, uh, new technologies such as telehealth. A lot of people living with these illnesses and their families are in, are in rural and remote locations. It's very difficult for them to access healthcare providers of any kind, particularly mental health providers. And so we are working at the level of HHS on putting together um, new ways of providing telehealth services. Uh, we think this is an important, an important resource for those living in rural areas. Areas. Um, our public members think that treatment and recovery uh, must be addressed uh, in a better way by the federal government, and they have made recommendations about coordination of specialty care. And I will tell you that at SAMHSA, we already have a program on first episode psychosis. We give block grants to the states for substance abuse and mental health issues, and 10% of those funds have to go to first episode psychosis programs. We also are starting a new program. We just got the funds from Congress and the President for clinical, what we call clinical high-risk individuals. These are people who have not been diagnosed, but who have vulnerability to a serious mental illness, may have a family history, may be showing some signs of, of a mental illness. We want to get to them early and provide them mainly psychosocial services. They don't have a diagnosis, and so unlikely that they would get medication. But what we're hoping is that if we can put together services that will meet their needs, their psychological needs, their needs to be successful in school and communities, that we can hopefully avert 
a serious mental illness or at least diminish the impact on that person's life, those programs will start next year. We have um, uh, our public members are telling us about the need for suicide prevention strategies and SAMHSA has um, newly instituted zero suicide programs. We know that most people who will attempt or complete suicide will be seen by some healthcare provider in the few months before they do this. And so we are, the zero suicide program trains health practitioners to ask about suicidality and to help a person make a safety plan and to get them, get them to treatment. We also uh, are working on issues related to housing. We um, at SAMHSA have a program that helps people who are marginally housed or who have unstable housing. We also, through this ISMIC committee, can work now with the Department of Housing and Urban Development on bringing together resources so that more housing resources will go to those with serious mental illness. We also, um, it's also been recommended that we focus on development of integrated services for mental, substance use, and physical health conditions, all in the same place. We need to make it as easy as possible for people to get all of the care and services they need. We already do this uh, to, to a certain extent in our federally qualified health centers, but we have a program at SAMHSA called the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Um, these, this is a demonstration that's going on in eight states right now, and it requires that services be brought together that include mental health services, substance use disorder services, physical health services, crisis intervention services available 24 hours a day. We think that this is going to, that these programs are going to show beneficial effects and we will be advocating for greater expansion. Um, I was very pleased that in the 18 budget uh, that we just got on March 23rd, we got another $100 million for these programs. And so you'll be seeing, for those of you who work in this area, you'll be seeing funding announcements from SAMHSA so that we can establish these programs in more communities across this nation. $100 million, still not nearly enough, but it's a start. Our public members recognize the issues around justice system involvement for people living with serious mental illness, um, so much so that it was an entire focus of their report, which by the way, if you want to see it, it's available on SAMHSA's website. Um, and they recommend that we invest in training first responders on how to work with people who are living with these conditions, um, that we sustain our therapeutic dockets in federal, state, and local courts, which I assure you we will do and hope to expand them, um, that we provide universal screening for mental and substance use disorders for people that are incarcerated, and that we reduce the barriers that impede immediate access to treatment and recovery services on release. And so one of the things that we advocate for uh, is in some states, uh, people who have Medicaid, um, if they are incarcerated, their Medicaid is cut off. They are discontinued from the Medicaid rolls. Why discontinue them? Why not just suspend Medicaid so that when they come out, it's immediately available to them again? Because I can tell you that when you, when you discontinue somebody's Medicaid, it can take months, months to get them back on it. And so this is something simple we can do. There are other approaches as well, and we'll be trying to utilize as many as possible because we know that when people are coming out of jails and prisons, this is a very vulnerable time for them. And so they need those community supports Finally, we have to pay for what we're talking about, right? We have to have finance strategies so that we can increase access uh, to treatment and to recovery support services. We work to eliminate financing practices that discriminate against those living with behavioral health conditions. Uh, we wanna see enforcement of existing parity laws. One of the things the Department of Health and Human Services has done is put a portal in place where people can go to get information and Get, uh, get put with the right program if they feel they've experienced a violation related to uh, parity. 
uh, we want psychiatric and other behavioral health services paid for at rates comparable to those for physical health care providers. Uh, we need more practitioners. Um, we, one of the reasons we don't have enough practitioners is because uh, behavioral health providers get paid less than their colleagues in primary care. So we need to change that. We need to provide reimbursement for outreach and engagement services related to mental health care. One of the things you're going to see in the next funding announcement for the Certified Community Behavioral Health Programs is that I want to see, uh, I want to see um, community recovery resources, and those will be paid for. The, 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 really, the beauty of the CCBHCs is that they are modeled after the FQHCs. That's probably way too much federal acronyms for you. Um, what, what I mean by that is that federally qualified health centers get rates of reimbursement that meet their costs. On the behavioral health side, we don't. And that's one of the reasons it's so hard to, to make care available widely. And so the CCBHCs are structured in the same way as the federally qualified health centers to pay at the rate that it costs to provide the services. And so we think that that's going to be a way to expand care to people who need it. And so these... Um, this work by our public members has really helped to set the stage for work by Health and Human Services and other federal departments for the coming years. And we will continue to rely on the ISMIC to help us to prioritize recommendations and to help us really push that agenda forward. And our overall goal, of course, is to improve the health and welfare of people who are living with serious mental illness. I want to talk just a minute about SAMHSA's justice programs because that really is the topic today. Um, on the mental illness side, we have adult and youth treatment court collaboratives. These are programs that, that intervene to, uh, to divert people away from incarceration and into treatment and community recovery support services. We try to focus those programs on individuals early early in their illness so that we can minimize uh, their, their interactions with the justice system. We have early diversion grants that, uh, that divert prior to arrest. Um, that is something that I will work very hard to expand because it's so stigmatizing. Once any conviction occurs, it is so stigmatizing. The time to intervene is before there are charges and there needs to be resources available so that we don't have to use our legal system to get people the basic care and necessities that they need. Um, I was very pleased when the president uh, agreed that this was an important program, and in his budget proposal for fiscal year 2019, um, there is an increase of $10 million. This may not sound like much, but this is a program that's funded at around somewhere between four and five million. So that's a tripling of funding. Um, we have an assisted outpatient treatment program uh, that aims to reduce the incidence and duration of psychiatric hospitalization, homelessness, incarceration, and interactions with the criminal justice system. This is a program that's a two-year demonstration. We'll be evaluating it and trying to determine what we can learn from that that might be helpful to other communities. On the substance use disorder side, we also have jail diversion program grants. Um, we have programs, again, that divert prior to booking for infractions. We have similar programs for veterans now. We have adult, juvenile, and family treatment drug courts that have been successful, and now we can use up to 20% of funding for medication-assisted treatment for individuals living with substance use disorders such as opioid use disorder or alcohol use disorder who need medication in addition to other types of supportive services. We've served many thousands of individuals now and, and uh, are pleased at SAMHSA uh, with, with how that's gone. We have an offender reentry program. This is something that I'm really hoping to expand uh, during my time in office. Um, that's a program that helps to make sure that people who are coming out of jails and prisons get to the appointments they need for the, to, to attend to their health care, um, their mental illness needs, their substance use disorder needs, and their physical health care needs. And we've now made it possible for our grantees to go into jails and prisons to work with people prior prior to their release so that we don't lose them. 
We have training and technical assistance programs. We have the Gaines Center that provides a lot of training and technical assistance for providers and criminal justice practitioners to try to establish best practices for people um, that they're working with in their systems who have mental and substance use disorders. We do policy academies for the states, and we have technical expert panels that focus on specific types of issues. I've listed a few here, but one being uh, that we have a guidelines for successful transition of people with mental or substance use disorders from jail and prison that talks about how to actually implement those services so that people, uh, as I said, can get what they need before they leave and then as they go back into their communities. So I'll just end by asking a couple of questions that I'm sure all of you think about and I'll tell you my view of them. Does everyone with serious mental illness need to be committed to treatment? Should a person experiencing a first episode of psychosis be committed for treatment? I would say the answer to that is no. No, it's a small number of people that are going to need civil commitment and that should be reserved for the most serious cases in which there is evidence of dangerousness. Um, the great majority of people with serious mental illnesses don't represent any kind of a, I don't have to tell you this, all of you in this room know this. It, it's, uh, commitment should be reserved for the few most serious cases. And I'm just gonna end by saying that having a serious mental illness is not a crime and we need to stop treating it like it is in the United States. People need to have access to treatment services, to community supports. We need a continuum of care. And when we do that, I'm hoping that none of our folks with these illnesses will end up in the justice system. Thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Um, Katz, I'm Rudy Caceres, and you had mentioned, and um, a few other parents had mentioned anagosnosia, and um, if people don't, if they don't know, it means, it usually means you're too sick to know you're sick, and is used as a reason to forcibly hospitalize someone. But um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, anagosnosia, it's not, it's not the gospel truth that is accepted um, widely by the medical community, oftentimes, You'll hear doctors say, even ones that are published in the National Institute of Mental Health say, well, this is what it looks like for me. I'm not 100% sure, but this is my personal opinion, and it kind of looks like this is what it is. But the fact is, that's not the same as having brain scans and having a majority of doctors say, okay, this is the brain of someone who hears things and sees things that others don't. Here's the anagosnosia, and boom, case closed. So the fact that this is used as a reason to lock people up, um, commit human rights abuse, and to um, deprive people of due process of the law, which is unconstitutional, it just seems very troubling, and it's just, it's not accepted, it's not the gospel truth um, worldwide in the medical community. So I just um, plead with you and others to not accept that as the gospel truth and to perpetuate it as if it is so. Thank you. Hello, I'm Patricia Barkley. I wonder if you could speak to the, what the federal government is doing to help fund the research and development of better psychotropic medications and or even find cures for these severe mental illnesses? So, um, so, so the agency that I'm responsible for, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, is not a research organization. We're a services organization. Um, the research is, is done at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And they do have uh, programs that undertake clinical trials to try to uh, to try to develop uh, medications that um, that will be more acceptable. And so, what do I mean by acceptable? Um, it's, it's been talked about. It's been talked about a number of times um, this morning that these medications, many of the medications that we have to treat psychosis, um, can be um, very impairing themselves. Um, if you have to take a medication that makes you feel terrible, you're not going to want to do that. And so, and then uh, those those medications that 
um, like we were talking about haloperidol. Uh, that's what we call the first generation neuroleptic drugs. Um, those have a lot of side effects that people find very difficult to tolerate. We have a, what we call second generation antipsychotic drugs now, which have less in the way of some of those side effects, but not without side effects. And also with the new generation medications, we have to worry about something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is, uh, is uh, when a person develops abnormalities in their blood glucose. They may develop diabetes, um, lipid abnormalities where they may develop hypertension, they may develop heart disease. Um, their weight gain can be a big issue. Um, these, these kinds of side effects, I mean, obviously we would like to have medications that don't that don't result in these things. Um, right now, what we have to do is monitor for those kinds of events to try to protect people as best we can from those kinds of outcomes. But NIMH is looking for those kinds of medications that would be more acceptable, less side effects, effective in reducing symptoms, and making it possible for people to not have adverse physical responses to them. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Alfredo Madrid. Um, this morning, afternoon, we we all know what we've talked about. Um, I'm using myself as an example up here. Um, we seem to have some negative connotations. Um, I consider myself a success story. I'm actually up here. I have a very kind, forgiving mother that has urged me to do this for years. Um, I could have gone many of which ways I didn't. Um, and I'm doing something with my life, and I feel it's time to give back to my community. So I want to thank Ms. Sachs, um, Ellen, Ellen um, everybody here. Um, if it's not possible with you guys, uh, this would this this progress wouldn't be happening. Um, the two questions I have concern um, a statement that you made that the majority of these individuals afflicted with these serious disorders are not actually violent. With the plague of the contemporary day in America, with mass shootings, there seems to be an excuse where the youth. Um, might be getting a misconception that these attackers might be suffering from some sort of mental illness. I hear these terms being thrown around in the media. I feel it is unfair. Um, so with that, I will leave you if, if we have uh, hope. What we're, in the education that we should instill in a city like LA, where Skid Row is right next to Spring and Broadway, um, it doesn't make any sense, so much poverty, LA County Jail, being a uh, biggest mental hospital in the country when it is a jail. We need, we need reform, we need, we, we need people at the top, and, and you know, events like this are obviously gonna help. So those are my questions, and I will leave you with a quote that in my opinion ha has given me hope uh, in recent years. It's by Plato um, in his state, in his uh, treatment, Phaedrus, uh, 360 BCE. As the ancients testify, madness is superior to a sane mind, for the one is only of human, but the other of divine origin. Thank you, guys. So I think, I think you make a, a very important point, and, and, and that is that people living with mental illness, for the most part, are not violent, and particularly those who are treated are no more violent than anyone else in our society. There, I think sometimes there is this rush to judgment because, because you see a, a horrific event and you think, well, somebody can't be in their right mind and do something like this. But this is something that we need to avoid because it further stigmatizes people that, that are good people and should not have to live with that kind of, of um, that kind of um, belief on the part of others. So how do we address it? We address it by talking about it. We address it by people like yourself and like others who, who have the courage to come forward and say, no, that's, that's not, that's not right. Y you, you are the ones who make the example and make it possible for people like me to try to move things forward in a bureaucracy. <laughs> Dr. McCants Katz, I can't tell you how happy and honored I am to be here talking to you. I followed your wild ride into 
an appointment that um, was a great outcome from a very difficult passage of uh, HR 2646, and also um, tried to educate my advocacy list on you. So thank you so much that you're on board. Um, I also appreciate very much all that you've said, um, but again, as a family member struggling for 10 years in an advocacy as well to help my son, there's this absence of the very critical foundation, I think, of absence of illness awareness. And when you talk about community treatment and you want to expand that, we have already done that. Community treatment hasn't really worked. Not perhaps because it cannot work, but perhaps the way it is it lacks so many components that I think we need to have in there. So I would like to hear from you when you say that advancing community treatment, but nothing about, let's say, IMDs, which are terrible and they really need to change. But for someone who refuses care, who refuses to have illness awareness, and I'm not sure it's totally a self-esteem issue, it may be a neurological condition, um, who won't want to be associated with any community treatment, who doesn't want to go. How do you propose that to relieve the problems we have with so much massive incarceration and homelessness? Thank you. Yeah, um, so, so obviously uh, we, have, we have a long way to go. Um, but, but what I would say is that, um, is that people, people who come to the attention of, of law enforcement, um, people who end up being incarcerated, um, are people that, that I'd like to see come to, to services first, to mental health programs that exist in communities, um, that, that we would be able to, rather than have them end up in the legal system, that we have crisis intervention services established across this nation. Uh, because we know that, that that's an opportunity to reach people. Will we change the minds of, of everyone living with these illnesses that, that they should get some kind of care? Probably not. If there are people that, that are not, if there are a lot of them that are invisible to society, right? Because unless there's something that happens that brings them to the attention of others, then we won't know about it. But for those who do, then we need to set up a different system. And so when you say that community services exist, well, they do, but they're totally inadequate. Totally inadequate. I mean, from, from the perspective of a practicing psychiatrist and, a, and from the perspective of being a family member, it's very difficult to navigate the system as it currently exists. It's very difficult, it's, it's impossible to get, to get care and services in any kind of a timely way. And that was with the Affordable Care Act. I actually thought the Affordable Care Act was gonna change things. Um, no, it, it, I didn't find that it changed things at all. So, um, so I think we need to do things differently. And so we have, we have some demonstrations going. Finally, we have these certified community behavioral health clinics. We're getting some good data from them. We've got the information about, about, um, about crisis intervention. We know that we can reduce hospitalizations very dramatically if we get people crisis intervention services uh, with providers that understand the issues. Emergency departments are not places in my opinion, for people with, with mental illness that's impairing them. They're frightening, people in the ED don't know how to deal with them, it's, it's, it's just a bad situation. So we need, to, we need to build on what we know. We know that federally qualified health centers work really well for physical health care, so why wouldn't they work for behavioral health care? We have a demonstration program if it works well, and I think it will, we should, be, we should be advocating to Congress, to our representatives, to people like me, to tell us, get this going across the country. Because until we get a continuum of care, and by the way, the other thing that's really problematic is that we have basically 
um, basically two levels of care, right? We have very, very uh, meager outpatient services, or we have a psych hospital. Well, what about all of the care in between? What about, what about um, places where people can, can live? What about, what about intensive outpatient programs? What about opportunities for group therapies or to meet with peers? Um, what about clubhouses? What about places that, that, that will help people in terms of getting back into school or getting jobs? Most people with serious mental illness want to work. But it's very hard for them, particularly with the way that they have to experience their illness in our society, which is too often through the legal system. So we have to push very hard for these things. It's, you know, people like me can, can do actually a fair amount. I'm, I'm kind of pleased with how things are going. Um, but we need constant pressure. We need constant pressure. I, it, running a state hospital system, I really loved having the advocates because they keep you on the right path. It's too easy. It's too easy to ignore or to not do what's right for people. When you have outside people looking at what you're doing, then, then you have to, you have to make adjustments. You have to change course. You have to do what makes sense and what's right. So just like the advocates make sure that people are not being discriminated against, particularly in places like state hospitals. It's gonna be very important for all of you to pay attention to what's happening and advocate for what you need. And advocate for all that you need, all that you need. Don't come to us. <laughs> you need more time, right? I was just gonna say, don't come and ask for some, some pittance because you think, oh, if I ask for what we need, we won't get anything. Tell Congress what you need. Tell your state legislators what you need and demand it. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we'll have to, we have to stop, but people can ask questions informally if they want. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks to everybody who helped put this together, like Chris Schneiders uh, and Gillian. And uh, thanks. <laughs>